Shalom and good morning to everybody. Everybody hear me okay? All right, wonderful. Uh, my name is Omer Eshel, and I am the Consul of Tourism for the Midwest region on behalf of Israel Ministry of Tourism. And I would like to thank you all for coming today to hear this lecture about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls are not just another exhibit. There are a tool for us to understand who we really are and what are the sets of our belief. Where did it come from? I had the privilege and the honor of heading the staff of Qumran, where they found the Dead Sea Scrolls for three years. So I know a little bit about the site. I heard about it. Um, and today we will try to dive in into the scrolls and into the life of the Qumranites, the people of this cult, and to try to understand what are the impacts that we see today, in 2012, beginning of 2013, well, what we see today, the way that we behave, the way that we believe, where it all started and where it all came from. The object of this presentation is, of course, for you to give you better tools to understand the uh, exhibit, which is right underneath us, but also for you to be able to go back to your homes, to your churches, your synagogues, your institutes, your friends, and to share with them the actual meaning behind the artifacts. Uh, after this presentation, uh, uh, there is a, a fair underneath of Israel tourism because we always say that when you're going to come to Israel, after you've been to Israel, you'll never be the same. This is just one site for a full, one site out of a full country. And the real way to understand really what it's all about is to follow his footsteps. Today we're just going to touch a little bit. At the end of this presentation, I will present uh, our friends that are downstairs to that will help you to accommodate this journey. I don't, I'm not using the word trip to Israel. Trip is, Florida is a trip, and Disney is a wonderful trip, but it's, it's not. It's a journey to the soul. It's a journey for you to understand who you really are. So, without further ado, my name again, as I said, Omer Eshel. I always joke around by saying a good presenter is a presenter that by the end of the presentation, people rem remember his name. So I wrote down here, so if, if you have any questions, we're going to go with that later on. Let's dive in. I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline for you to understand where exactly we're standing. In Israel, the timeline is immense. It's not, I remember I was at the Library of Congress and they said, and, and I watched the Declaration of Independence, and uh, the, the guard that came to me said, ain't that the oldest piece of document you've ever seen? I'm like, yeah, no, 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 not really, but yeah, it's very respectful, absolutely. So we are now, to need to dive in to understand where we're standing. So 586 BC, destruction of the first temple, the reason why I put this here, you will find artifacts underneath here in the presentation that will describe that they're coming from this period of time, from the time of the kings, Hezekiah, even Solomon, uh, 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 Hezekiah, Josiah, all the great kings of Judea. Uh, follow that, the 520 BC, we have the return of the exile. We have the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and the rebuilding of the second temple. We're going to run fast forward, uh, uh, Alexander the Great, Hasmonean period, uh, we have the early Roman period uh, by Pompey, following after that, of course, the crowning of King Herod the Great, the same Herod from the Bible, the one with the census, that the Holy Family had to flee to, uh, to Egypt. This is the same guy. What you see up here, this is a replica of uh, uh, a model of the Second Temple. Today, you can actually visit right here, this street, you can visit this, you can see remains of this arch. And here it, it, it is believed that Jesus tossed the tables of the uh, money changers. So you can actually be able to see that as well. Uh, we have the first Jewish revolt in the year 66 AD. This is something very, very uh, uh, important for us. One of the most important historians that we have, his name is Josephus Flavius. He was the commander of the Galilee. Now, Flavius is a, is a Latin nickname. Because flevit in, in, in Latin is tear, is crying. So, don't, so uh, 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 Josephus Flavius is Josephus the crier. I can imagine what happened when they took him out of his 
hiding a point, kicking and screaming, he, can, he got that nickname. But what's important for our story is Josephus is one of the most accurate historians, and he speaks profoundly about the Essene and about the political layout of the land of Judea on the eve of the destruction of the temple, which is very, very important to our story of the scrolls. Continue. This is one of the most important slides in the entire presentation. We have to remember, it's crucial for us, the year 68 AD, or CE, was the year of the destruction of Qumran. The year 70 was Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was destroyed after Qumran. Extremely important for us to remember that. 73 AD or CE, that's the destruction of Masada. This is it. This is the castle of uh, Herod. Following that, we're going to have the late Roman period. After the late Roman period, we have the Bar Kokhba revolt and the exile of the Jews from the kingdom of Judea, or from the province of Judea, uh, changing the, the name from Judea to Palestine, named after the Philistines. After that, we have the Byzantine period, Constantine the Great, following by the Nicaea Committee, following by the Arab, the first Arab occupation in 638 AD. That's the timeline. So we just covered about a thousand years in three minutes. Land of miracles, I'm telling you. All right, so let's dive in and to see, to see what exactly are we talking about. There were three main uh, uh, political groups or main streams of Judaism that were uh, uh, custom at the time in Judea at the first century CE. We have the Sadducees, the Pharisees, and the Essenes. Let's dive in to understand who they are. Sadducees. Sadducees start from the word Sadok. In Hebrew, we say Tzdukim. Many people have their misinterpretation that Tzdukim comes from the, from the Hebrew word Sadik, which means righteousness. No, it is not. The reason why it's called Sadducees, if you turn to book of Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel, and we see the story of the crowning of Solomon, Solomon was crowned by Sadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet. Meaning the high priest in the kingdom of David, under the kingdom of David, was Sadok. That was his name. So Sadok was the founder of a dynasty that later on became to be Sadducees, Sadukim. They are named after the high priest of King David. They were the elite of Judea, elite in everything, in economy, in religion, in politics. And they were also something very important. They rejected the oral law. The oral law is a very important codex of rules that today we know it as the Mishnah and Talmud. It's uh, 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 um, the extension of the, by the rule of extension of the Bible. They rejected that. Pharisees. Pharisees, Purushim, they were the vast majority of uh, the Israelite or the inhabitant of Judea at the time. Uh, they were the average Joe. The thing is that they did accept the oral law. Again, the Mishnah and the Talmud for years to come. And the third group, the smallest, but the one that makes a lot of noise, are the Essene. The Essene were in remote areas, such as Judean Desert, such as the Negev Desert, Carmel Mountain. Carmel Mountain today has one of the most beautiful cities, I think, in the world, the city of Haifa, with gorgeous Baha'i gardens from top to bottom of the mountain, spectacular view. But at the time, uh, 2,000 years ago, it was dense forest. Actually, when we read the book with the story of Ahab and Jezebel, Elijah flees to Carmel because it was so dense, it was so remote an area. So the Essene lived in those areas and they tried to, to segregate themselves from the rest of uh, the general population. There are two very extreme sects of the Essene, the Zealots, the same people who inhabited Masada. They are the same people who burned down the storages of the temple on the eve of the destruction. And we have also the Sikari. Sikra in Aramaic meaning knife. They were political assassins. Okay? So these are the three main groups. Now, we're going to dive in to understand where is the Dead Sea and try to penetrate deeper into what we're about uh, to see later on. The Dead Sea, well, if you look in the American scale, it's more of a pond than a sea. But uh, if the Bible calls it a sea, who am I to beg to differ? So that's the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is right in the middle of one of the largest geological fracture in the world, the Syrian African fracture. That starts in Syria and ends in Africa, hence the Syrian African fracture. Uh, 
that structure gave birth also to the Sea of Galilee, to the Jordan River, to the Nile, and to Lake Victoria, all the way down at the end. Something very important for us to remember. When we are traveling 2,000 years ago, the main highways had to be next to source of water. Something very, very important for us to remember. You cannot decide where you want to go because you cannot carve tunnels into the, into, into, uh, 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 into the mountain. They, they were lacking the technology to do that. So all the main highways, especially in desert area, have to go through source of water. Three major international highways were in the land of Judea. One is the Via Rex, Road of the King, following the Jordan Valley. This is the same road that Jesus took when he went from Nazareth all the way down to Jerusalem. That's the Via Rex. The Dead Sea is right in the middle of that road. Second one is Via Patria, the Road of the Fathers, over the, over the, the, uh, the main mountains. And the third one, Via Maris, the Road of the Sea. By the way, those three roads today are major highways in Israel. Via Maris, highway number two. Via Rex, highway number, highway number 90. Via Patria, highway number 60. Just dig underneath the asphalt, you'll find the Roman, the Roman road. Same road. Nothing changed that well, a little bit changed, but not much in the Middle East. So, let's get a little bit of some geographical facts. Middle East is the lowest place in the world. It is 410 mi uh, minus 410 meters, which is about 1,400 feet below sea level. Just to give a comparison, Jerusalem, which is 20 miles away from the Dead Sea, is, I'm, trying, I'm calculating that for meters, it's 2,400 feet above sea level. Sea level. So you've got 3,000 feet difference in elevation in 20 miles. Your ears will pop when you're going to drive from Jerusalem to the Dead Sea. It's quite an experience. Uh, of course, you can float in the Dead Sea. This is also one of the miracles. You cannot, you cannot drown. And the Dead Sea also uh, uh, has phenomenons of extremely rich minerals, which will play a crucial uh, 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 role in the economy of the uh, Kermanites. Something very unique to see that. We, you know, we always look at it and say, okay, the theories are nice. The Dead Sea blocks the road of the kings. So how exactly did they go? What, did it sail on the, on the Dead Sea? It doesn't make any sense. Well, actually, yes, it does. This is a, a picture of a map that's called Medeba. The map of Medeba, which is in Jordan. This is the most accurate and oldest map we have of the Holy Land. It's dated to the 6th century, 6th, 7th century AD. Now, I circled for you the city of Jerusalem. And look at this. See the boats? You see the, this dome over here? This is merchant boat. So people came on the Jordan River, had a dock over here, and continued along the Dead Sea all the way down. And we have more than one boat. See, we have two boats, actually three. There's one in the back. So this is a very, very heavy traveled route. Now, why exactly we care about this? If we look at the site of Qumran, Qumran is situated, whoops, sorry. Qumran is situated, well, you see it, I don't need this. Qumran is situated right on the main highway. Now, let's go back and say, the Essenes were people who tried to segregate themselves from the rest of the world. If you try to segregate yourself from the rest of the world, why are you in the middle of the main highway? Right? Now, it's exactly the same. I explained that to my wife when we drove down uh, in Chicago. There is six flags on the road, on the side of the road. You see the six flags, but you don't, the, the road doesn't reach the six flags. You have to take a few exits after that, do a UE, then return, then you get to the six flags. But if you ask anyone in Chicago, do you know about the six flags on, uh, on Highway 94? Sure, of course I know it. It's the same thing. If you would have asked travelers, do you know about the criminals? Yeah, of course, that patch of green right there on the Dead Sea. You ever been there? No, I've never been there, but I know they're there. So you're actually on the main highway, but you are not on the main highway. This is very important for us to know why they chose this place, because of the philosophy of this cult. This cult had uh, a belief which is called the Son of Light versus Son of Darkness. We're going to dive into this a little bit uh, uh, later in this presentation. They believe that they are the Son of Light. And they wanted to project to the rest of the world, we are the Son of Light. But in order to be a member of the Son of Light, you need to work very, very, very hard. Keep that in mind. Uh, the place itself of Qumran, just some geographical facts, the name Qumran is, come from Arabic. It's called Kamar, moon, 
a lot of names along the Jordan Valley associated with the moon. For example, the city of Jericho comes from the Hebrew word Yerech, Yericho, Yerech. The reason being is very, very simple. If you stand here in the night, you see the moon rises over the Moab mountain and the trail of light all over the Dead Sea, you fall down to your knees. So the ancient people associated all the entire area of the Jordan Valley to the moon, to the birth of the moon. Hence, Kumiran as well. The first time we see establishment of a castle or a, uh, a form of settlement in that area is in the book of Josh Joshua. The name of uh, uh, the place was Schacha. There's one artifact from the first temple period, which is a main water cistern, a huge round water cistern from the, from the first temple period, and this is Schacha. Now, who were the Cormanites? Most scholars believe today that the Cormanites were Essene or associated with the Essene. It might be so, but the origin of the cult was probably Sadducees. I'm going back to what we said about the revolt against the Greeks, the establishment of the Hasmonean state. When the Hasmonean state was established, there were two families, Sadducees of course, who fought who will be the high priest. One of the families was expelled or exiled to the desert of the city. Well, if this is Jerusalem, well, you see, it doesn't work. If Jerusalem is right over there, and all the, everything on the right side of Jerusalem is desert, we know what the desert of the city means. Qumran is no more than 17 miles away from Jerusalem. So we believe that the first establishment were Sadducees. There's two, there's two other ways that we try to, to uh, prove this theory. Uh, uh, first of all, the wealth of this cult. It was one of the most wealthiest cult in the entire East. Second of all, their sworn enemies, the people of darkness, were not the Romans. They were the Sadducees. The sworn enemies of the Cumanites were the Sadducees. Now, if you hate someone so much, you need to have something to do with him. So the, the, the belief is that the origin of the cult was Sadducees. The most amazing thing about this cult, it was open for everybody. If you want to be a member of the Kumarnites, you have to be accepted by the cult after two years of training, then you are voted if you're in or out, and then you become a member of the Kumarnites. Okay? How we know this, we're going to dive in a few minutes. Let's go to the finding itself. This is cave number four. The story of the scrolls, how they found it, is quite amazing. In the year 1947, there was a Bedouin kid walking with herds of goats in the Judean desert. And one of the goats got into a cave. The kid took a rock and threw it inside the cave because he thought there's an animal over there. He was afraid to come in. And he heard the sound of broken clay. The next morning, he walked in and he saw you know, broken jaws with weird letter thingies, with weird letters. Now, if you're a Bedouin kid in 1947, you found leather in the desert, you're going to make yourself some nice pair of sandals. He took the Dead Sea Scrolls and by Coincidence, act of God, I don't know how you want to call it. The guest of his father at the tent was one of the bishops of the Assyrian church in Jerusalem. And he recognized the handwriting. And he said to the kid, I'm going to give you 20 bucks if you give, give me that. So sure, please, yeah, take it. And then there was a story with the Bedouins that this crazy clergy was willing to pay good money for pieces of leather. And there was a huge race between archaeologists and, and Bedouins to find remains of the scrolls. Thank God the biggest treasure of the scrolls were found in cave number four that was found by archaeologists. 15,000 fragments of scrolls were found over there. We, that's why we call it the library. All the pictures you're going to see downstairs of the, of the uh, caves on the cliff, that's cave number four. You will see downstairs also that some of the scrolls themselves are cut by scissors. It's not they say. They say they didn't cut them in scissors. When the Bedouin found those scrolls, they cut them in pieces because they couldn't make more money out of it. Uh, cave number three, the copper scroll, it's a cool story that we'll talk about in a few minutes. Let's dive into the scrolls themselves. This is a picture that was taken uh, from the uh, uh, shrine of the book, where all the scrolls that we know today are uh, kept inside there in a bunker on the underground, because this, again, this is a treasure for humanity. It's in the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. What are the scrolls about? The scrolls are being uh, uh, 
called upon in the language of the, uh, 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 or the nickname of the Kurmanites as Serach. Serach is a scroll. We have different kind of srachim or scrolls, not necessarily biblical. We have one which is called Tat Hayachad, the together community. That's the name that they call themselves. The Kurmanites never call themselves Kurmanites, of course, because it's come from Arabic. Second of all, they never call themselves Isin. They call themselves the Yachad, the together. This is a codex of laws that we know exactly what you need to do in order to become a member of the Kumanite. This is the manual. It's the same as going to open any regular book in any Benedictine monastery, and you're going to get the regular. That's the regular. It's exactly the same one. Now, from that, we know few profound findings. Number one, they had to pray a third of the night in order to be members. If you speak during any kind of meal without any permission, you'll be expelled for three days. Folks, expelled for three days at that time, meaning no food and no water for three days. Expelled out. Thirdly, they had no women. How did they reproduce? Well, they didn't. They just joined. People join in. Something very important also. They ate together. We should not take it lightly, ate together. When you look at the Bible, the, the verb of eating symbolize much more than just sharing food together. When Abraham met Melchizedek in the book of Genesis, he gives him bread and wine. Jesus gives bread and wine to his disciples. When you look at the bread, the act of bread and wine in, uh, uh, early Ju in Judaism, early Christianity, it's a sign of a pact. When you uh, 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 share your bread, you are brothers. Now, the biggest concern of anyone 2,000 years ago was not if the iPhone 5 is better than the iPhone 4S. That wasn't the, big, the biggest concern. The biggest concern was, what am I going to have for my next meal? If you have a community of 200 people that offers you three full meals a day, that's huge. That is huge. That is why so many people wanted to join the cult. Another thing that we know, if you want to be a member of the Kumaranites, you have to forfeit your position. Everything you have goes into the hands of the Kumaranites, the Kumaranites, okay? Something quite amazing about the community rule. We know that in order to be, as I said before, in order to be a member, you have to be in a trial for two years. There was a very charismatic person. We don't know the name, but the scroll talks about a very charismatic person who tried to enter to the Kumaranites and after two years decided he doesn't want to do it anymore. Now, the emphasis of cleansing, of baptizing, is huge on the community rule. The emphasis of holy bread and holy wine, in those words, holy bread and holy wine that were made by our priest is profound in this scroll. Now, I'm going back to the base of Christianity, the two sacraments of mass, holy bread and holy wine, and baptism. Most scholars today believe that that person that is mentioned in the scrolls is no other than John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist observed this kind of lifestyle. Look how similar this is to a monastery. It's not a monastery. Christianity did not exist at that time. How similar? This is the same foundation. When John the Baptist observed these laws, this way of understanding, and when he said, I don't want to be a member of the cult anymore, he went to baptize people in the Jordan River, which is a mile away from Qumran. Continuing down, we have Bneo Bne Choshech, people of light versus people of darkness. Now, the vision of the, the end of days and the great war, we know it from the book of Zechariah. But this is the first time we hear of people of light versus people of darkness. Rings a bell, doesn't it? A little bit. Book of Revelation. The notion of the great war of the people of the Lord against the people of the Antichrist. Going down again, we have, uh, well, this does, I didn't write down here, the early acceptance. Early acceptance is the fact that a person has no way to control his life. The Lord will decide how his life will be, and he is determined the day, the day he is, that he is born. Of course, we don't know what the Lord decides for us. So that's why people continue to practice uh, 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 the Word of God according to, to, the, to the Scriptures. But that early acceptance echoes throughout the generations into Christian beliefs today. This is where it all started. Now, we have to remember that when the first Christian started Christianity, they didn't have the scrolls. The scrolls were hidden down in the, in, the, in the desert. The scrolls were found in 1947. 
Last time I checked, Christianity was a little bit before 1947. But the power of the acts of those Humanites echoed. And the tradition moved through very charismatic people, such as John the Baptist. We have another codex of scroll, which is the biblical scroll. We have every single one of the Bible books that we know today, apart from the book of Esther. The reason why they don't have the book of Esther over here, because for them it was a recent event. The story with, the, with the, the, the Persian king, they said, ah, Persian king, it just happened. It's not a holy book. So that's out of the, of the codex. And they have one Psalms more than what we have. Everything else is exactly the same. You will go downstairs today and you will see the chapter of book of Exodus 20, the Ten Commandments, word for word. It, just, it looks like it was just came out of the print today. Exactly the same. And of course, the Pesher scroll. Pesher is the explanation. One of the biggest ones is called Pesher Habakkuk, the explanation of Habakkuk, the prophet. They took stories of prophets in the Bible and explain how their acts are being shown today. Kinda, again, rings a bell a little bit with the uh, uh, prefiguration. The ideas of figures in the past, such as Elijah the prophet, will be echoing <coughs> throughout the eras, such as John the Baptist. The similarity between the Old Testament and the New Testament is not something that was invented by the Byzantines. It's something that was written down by the Kurmanites as well. These are the jars that the, the scroll were found. Scrolls that were found in those jars were almost intact. Scrolls that were found in jars that are broken naturally were not in such a good shape. You will see one of these jars, actual one, downstairs at the exhibit. This is how the site of Qumran looks like. I'm not going to go into the smaller details of what is what, but one thing is very, very obvious. You see all those blue patches? There are 13 mikvehs or ritual baths in Qumran. This area sees less than two inches of rain per year. So, in order for you to clean yourself, you need to have enough water, according to the Jewish tradition, you have to have enough water to you for you to submerge yourself completely all the way down and then come up. Meaning you have to have a body of water, not just a puddle. You don't just need to wash your face. And if they said you have to clean yourself three times a day, you have to have a lot of water. But this area sees less than two inches of rain. So how, how is that possible? We'll touch this in a second. It's a track of genius. But one of the main reasons why they ask for people to, or demand people to uh, clean themselves all the time is because of the harsh reality of the climate. Sometimes in the summertime, this area sees almost 120 degrees. Now, the ancient Kumanites didn't know what sanitation means, but they did know if you're not going to clean yourself, you're going to get diseased. So you have to clean yourself three times a day. John the Baptist also observed this understanding of hygiene. We today call it hygiene. They call it command. Absorb that. This was one of his emphasis. Same thing. This is a uh, uh, um, uh, model of how it's supposed to look like. Uh, because the, the date trees that you see on both sides of the site, uh, we actually found grains of, uh, of dates over there. So it's not just the wild imagination of the, of the artist. The site itself was not a living quarter. This was more of a JCC, if you will, or a community center. This was a place of worship, a place of study, and a place of uh, manufacturing. The people lived around in huts and caves around the, uh, uh, the site itself. Okay? That's why we didn't find any private stove, again, we couldn't find any private stove because they ate together. Food, as I said before, food is huge, huge in the old times. This is one of the only sects or only cult that we see, that again, offers three meals a day. Something not to be lightheaded about it. What you see over here, this stack of, of dishes were found in situ, meaning in the site itself, as you can see right now, stash one on each other, we found about 990 artifacts like this, a third of them made out of stone. Why stone is so important? We're going to go back to this in a few minutes. Holy bread and holy wine, again, the first time we hear this combination, holy bread and holy wine that was made by the priest and only by the priest is at Qumran in the community room. Wine jars, uh, regular cooking pots, 
Again, artifacts were found in the place. One of the secrets of the cult was something that's called the afarsemon, the parsimon blossom. It's not the fruit that we know today. In the ancient time, the most expensive fragrance was called afarsemon. Queen Cleopatra actually fought against Herod to claim control on the gardens of the parsimon because she knew it's a lot of money. The Kumanites probably know, knew how to make this fragrance. It was so, this secret was, was kept uh, so well, it's about the same as the recipe of Coca-Cola today. So, actually in Engedi, which is situated, well, you can see it, Engedi, about, I would say, 40 minutes drive from Qumran, there is a full inscription on a synagogue that says, curses he who will reveal the secret of the Parsimon. Now, when you have this patent, when you are the only one who can make this, and this is a world-known fragrance, you make a lot of money which again come to the understanding how they could afford three meals a day and why people wanted to join this cult and why their ideas resonated so much. If you look at small countries today, for example, if it wasn't for the oil of Kuwait, no one even knew where Kuwait lies. It's about the same thing. Everybody knows about Qumran, not just because of their ideas, but because of the money that they make. As I said, nothing really changed in the past 2,000 years. Mikvez, again, uh, uh, the, the, this is one of the ritual baths. You can see that you have one set of steps, narrow, going down, and another set of steps going up, much wider. The reason why it's much wider, because if you go down, you're unclean. If you go up, you clean, you need a lot of space for people not to touch you. Because if someone touched you, you need to do the entire thing again. So that's just practicality. Water, as we said before. This is the waterfall of Qumran. Usually it's very, very, very dry. If you go back again and look at the map, you see this blue line connecting between all the reservoirs. You see that? Okay? This blue line is an aqueduct. What they did is something stroke of genius. In the desert, when you look at the soil, the structure of the soil of the desert is made out of really, really small grains. The first drop of, of rain, of water, to touch those grains, those grains will swallow up like a sponge. The second drop of rain will slide over. That's why the Bible talks so many times about floods in the Negev, floods in the desert, okay? So the water have been harvested from a, an immense area and funneled into one huge waterfall. What the Kumanites did, they built a canal. I hope this will work now. They built a canal. Oh, there we go. At the mouth of the waterfall, there's a canal over here carving into the, into the rock and then harvesting some of the water into an aqueduct. You will see that aqueduct in the pictures downstairs. One flood cleans the whole thing. So we can understand how did they got the water. We can understand how they could make people the command of cleaning themselves, how, why it was so important. Because they did have the water. Stroke of genius. Religious, we spoke about this, the early sentence and uh, the temple scroll. Again, we have to understand that those people, the ideas that they had, were the foundation of a new religion. At that time, there were many, many, many sects, not just of Jews, also of, of, of pagans, throughout the land of Judea, because there was a clash between two empires, the Roman Empire and the Parthian Empire. So there's a lot of diffusion between the two empires. Here we have the foundation of the new religion, which is called Christianity, which will emerge about 60, 70 years after the destruction of Qumran. These are some of the scrolls I, I put down for you to see. The community rule, the war scroll, and of course my favorite prophet of all, Isaiah. I love Isaiah. The Isaiah scroll, which is the most intact one. This is the copper scroll. It's a fun story. In 1953, a copper scroll was found in cave number three. Why is it called a copper scroll? Because it's made out of copper. Archaeologists are not known for their imagination. That scroll speaks about an immense treasure. We knew these guys were very, very rich. When the Romans approached, they took all the treasures and hid them in the mountains and the caves around. This scroll tells exactly which each treasure lies. The problem is it uses artifacts that are no longer there. Dig next to the third tree on the right. Thank you. Well, okay. There was a scholar by the name Vendel Jones. Real guy, Vendel Jones, who had an access to this scroll. By the way, it's open to the public. 
anyone can have a, a copy of, of the scroll. He had that scroll and he dug every single pothole in the desert. We call him the National Park Authority Vandalism Jones. He didn't find anything, but you can, t you can say that the treasure of the Kumarites was found in a different way. And I explained. There was a reporter that saw Vendel Jones with the hat and everything, and they're the great archaeologist. He was very, very moved by this crazy archaeologist who's looking for a lost Jewish uh, 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 treasure. So he went to another guy that he knows by the name George Lucas. And George Lucas said, hmm, a crazy archaeologist that's looking for a Jewish treasure. The first one was Raiders of the Lost Ark. So that counts. In a way, you can say that George Lucas kind of find the treasure of the Kumarites for the income of the ticket, but this regardless to, uh, to, to what we're about to say now. Uh, we're not going to talk about this because we already did, about the religion, the, 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 the foundation of, again, the two basic sacraments, the basic sacraments, baptism and, uh, and uh, 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 mass. Stone vessels. I said before that we found a third of all the, the dishes were made out of stone. In Judaism, a stone vessel will never be contaminated. It will always stay pure. The problem is to buy one stone vessel costs like 30 clay vessels. So it's a lot of money. If you had out of 990 artifacts, a third of them, a third is stone vessels, this is a fortune, fortune. And we know that this community put a lot of their efforts to buy and to sustain this level of purity. Uh, again, uh, 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 um, laws that we have from the uh, community rule. This is the actual table, the real table that the scribe wrote down uh, the scrolls on them. We found small pieces of ink and jars of ink right next to it. Today, this is the museum in Amman. In Qumran itself, you'll find a replica of this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, table. This room right over here and this room right over here were the library. The author's room was above. When the, the place was destroyed, it collapsed and tilted. We found the, 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 the table right, right over in that room, <laughs> right over there. So you can see that the table were above. This is something incredible. You know, sometimes we look at archaeology as a pile of rocks and say, oh, you know what? Who knows what they, they, how, how they thought 2,000 years ago? They thought exactly like we did. Do you know of, there was sometimes, many, many years ago, this archaeological chain by the name Blockbuster? Many, many, many years ago, they used this really old kind of format called DVDs, right? Something like that, yeah? You remember that you can put back your DVD into a slot in the, in the wall? You remember that? Same thing. You see this window right over here? One, window one and a return window right over here. And all around here were benches. So this was the study room. Here, probably, probably, most likely, John the Baptist sat down, read the third of the night, he said, this is deep, this is deep. Agriculture, well, we, we spoke about uh, what kind of trade they had, uh, just stuff of artifact that we found, rope making, basket making, agriculture, very primitive, by the way, uh, agriculture, mostly date, and of course, the parsimon, when you have that knowledge, you don't need to grow wheat. Plus, you can't in that kind of climate. Were there any women in Qumran? Great question. No, there were not. How do we know that? We couldn't find any skeletons of women. There were four women that were found, but they were Saracen, 200 years after Qumran. So you ask, how did they reproduce? They didn't. It's like a monastery. If you want to be a member of the Qumranites, fine. You need to be a guy, and you need to have uh, some kind of a position they will give it to the Kumanites. We know that from the community rule. So in 2001, they found a comb. They said, ah, oh, if there is a comb, there were women. Now, this is a little bit sexist. There were almost monks. If you look at the book of, of Samuel, if you look at the book of Leviticus, if you look at the, the, the book of Kings, the, uh, 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 the prophets didn't shave, and they didn't cut their hair. I think a comb will be not a surprise to find over there. Okay. Um, other archaeology. Oh, how many people live in the in the community? We can tell approximately by the number of graves, give or take around 200 people. Give or take around 200 people. You can see also by the size of the refectorium of the dining room and the and the amount of dishes. So give or take about 200 people. 
other uh, theories about this site. Some people say it was a fort. Some people say it was just a factory with nothing to do with uh, that the scrolls were not even written down there. Uh, some people say it was a farm. But most of scholars until today believe that this is the site of the Kurmanites where they, found, where they wrote down the scrolls. Something quite amazing about archaeology. I've got to share this with you. Archaeology is a science that's based on absolutely nothing. It's all theories. I can have the best theory in the world, tomorrow we're going to dig a little bit further down, and then the entire theory is wrong. Unless you find something that says, this is the house of, which we have that. So in conclusion of what exactly are the Dead Sea Scrolls, and why are they important for us, like any other uh, archaeological artifact, but especially for us. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the foundation of who we are today. Not the scrolls themselves, the ideas of the scrolls. The, the echo of the scrolls throughout the eras. And something which is, you know, I, I always play around with this notion of uh, uh, how it changed the world. You remember when we said Qumran was destroyed in the year 68 AD. Jerusalem was destroyed in the year 70 AD. Now, the Qumranites called the high priest of Jerusalem the evil priest. He is the, he is the priest of the son of darkness because they are the Sadducees. So imagine the year now is 68, and you see a, a Kumarnite standing on the, on the wall and see the huge 25,000 Romans marching at him. He calls upon his teacher, and he said, teacher, what should we do? So the teacher said, this is the great war, people of light versus people of darkness. Obviously, we're going to lose, obviously, which again goes to the book of Revelation. It's not only one battle. It's not only one battle. So the uh, teacher says to... Uh, uh, to, the, to the guard, pick up all the scrolls and hide them in the mountains. By the way, every Jewish community that was on the brink of extinction throughout the history, what they did, first thing, took the Torah scrolls and hid them away. Every single one of them. Because you want to preserve your knowledge to the future. He said, probably, the teacher said, we are the son of light, so we cannot lose. We may, may be going to lose this battle, but we will prevail at the end. He was right. 2,000 years later, we did find the scrolls. But 2,000 years later. Now, let's play a little game. Let's say the year is now 70 AD, and the Romans went from the west, not from the east. They destroyed the temple beforehand. And then they came to Qumran. The same guard stands on the same keep, sees a huge army that just destroyed the Jewish temple, which automatically, automatically make them people of light, because they just destroyed the temple of the people of darkness. So the gates of Qumran would have been open, and maybe the ideas would not have you know, echoed throughout the history. Maybe Christianity was completely different. Maybe Judaism was completely different. Put for thought. It's a Roman general that stood in the middle of a highway and goes, yeah, let's take a left turn here. The reason why we're showing this, this is just one site in Israel, one site. We need to understand that by going to Israel, you really see how the Bible comes to life before your very eye. We in the Ministry of Tourism had made for you a special series of uh, DVDs, which is called Bible Come to Life. I'll show you one chapter that deals exactly with this, with the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, that you can use that as a tool, especially for Bible studies, especially for Bible studies. The best way to understand really what it's all about is to come to Israel. So we will show you now one chapter, and after that I will open uh, uh, the stage for a few minutes for our partners to t let you know that how they can help you uh, reach this journey of a lifetime.